Rashomon is a classic film from legendary director Akira Kurosawa, released in 1950 and based on the short story In a Grove by Ryonosuka Akutagawa. In the film, the wife of a samurai is attacked by a bandit. The samurai and the bandit fight over the wife's honor, resulting in the samurai's death. The details of what happened unfold during a trial as we hear testimony from the wife, the bandit, and the deceased samurai who testifies through a medium channeling his spirit. Each story tells the same major events, but each version is very different as the person testifying spins events to make themselves look better and the others to look worse. In the end, the truth lies somewhere in the middle of the conflicting stories. Why do I bring this up? Because that's what it's like trying to do this f***ing show. Attempting to tell the history of tabletop gaming is difficult as many of the events happened decades ago in an era before everyone wrote down every random thought and took pictures of every convention bagel for social media. Many of the people involved in these events have left the gaming industry and are difficult to get in contact with, while many others have sadly passed away. Physical evidence is difficult to find as many of the companies have been sold or gone out of business, leaving their records in recycling plants and landfills, or even destroyed by disasters like floods or fires. The few direct accounts we have from the time tend to be from interviews for gaming magazines where industry professionals are almost always promoting a new product and thus wouldn't want to bring up anything that would make themselves look bad, nor would they want to badmouth other companies or professionals in print. So a lot of the events that were important to the development of the industry as we know it today are tangled in contradictory stories, half-truths, rumors, or worse. And yes, there's a specific reason why I'm complaining about this. It's so I can talk to you about deities and demigods. Deities and Demigods was a source book for Advanced Dungeons & Dragons 1st Edition focused on descriptions and statistics for gods, demigods, deities, demons, devils, and even some legendary heroic mortals. If you wanted your party to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the likes of Asmodeus, Demigorgon, Zeus, and others, this was the book as it had stat blocks for everyone. The book became legendary in gaming circles, though not so much for its content as what content it lost. The first two printings of the book included statistics for characters from the Elric series by Michael Moorcock and the Great Old Ones from H.P. Lovecraft's Cthulhu Mythos. The third printing and later, those stats were removed. It made people ask why their favorite Lovecraftian monsters vanished from the book. However, no one was talking. This was before the internet, so the best information anyone had was, I heard from a buddy whose cousin's DM was at a convention and he heard... So the rumors turned to legend, the legend turned to myth, and used copies of the first two printings started selling for more than 10 times their cover price. But we're now in the era of the internet, with information at our fingertips. Surely we can do better now at figuring out the truth? Let's see what three people who are actually there for the events have to say. James M. Ward was the designer on Deities and Demigods. According to a Facebook post he made recounting the story, he made a list of all the different pantheons he wanted to include in the book and submitted the list to Gary Gygax. Gygax looked over the list and noted that the Lovecraftian mythos, as well as the Elric material, may cause rights problems as they weren't public domain. Gygax got the address for Ockham House, the managers of Lovecraft's estate, and for Michael Moorcock himself. Ward wrote to both, and surprisingly, they gave full permission with no licensing fees required. Ward finished the book and it sold well. Then Chaosium, the company making the Call of Cthulhu role-playing game, sent a cease and desist order demanding that TSR stop selling deities and demigods or they would sue. Even with Dungeons & Dragons growing at the time, TSR was still not a very large company, and one of the board members, Brian Bloom, didn't want to hire a law firm in California to fight the case, even though they had letters proving they had permission to use the characters. It was too late to make major changes to the text in time for the second printing, so TSR worked out a settlement with Chaosium that allowed the second printing to go forward so long as an acknowledgement was added to the front of the book and material removed from later printings. At some point not long after, the letters from Arkham House and Michael Moorcock were lost from the TSR archives and have never been found. <music> 
Over at Chaosium, Steve Perrin, designer of RuneQuest and one of the writers on Call of Cthulhu, says that the problem wasn't lawyers, it was agents. Specifically, Chaosium negotiated an exclusive license for the Elric books and related material for gaming through Moorcock's agent, as such licenses are normally handled. At the same time, Ward sent his letter directly to Michael Moorcock himself and, him being a big fan of Dungeons & Dragons, approved the use of the Elric material without notifying his agent because he wasn't aware of any other negotiations going on. Therefore, the only person Chaosium had a legal case against over the Elric material wasn't with TSR, but with Michael Moorcock himself for violating the exclusivity of the license. And since a licensee suing their licensor is never going to look good when you're launching the very product that license is for, they decided to look for an alternative solution. As far as the Cthulhu mythos goes, Chaosium had a license from Arkham House to use the text of the novels, but many of the creatures themselves were public domain. The biggest problem, though, were the Blooms. Brian and Kevin Bloom, along with Gary Gygax, made up the board of directors at TSR. They didn't want to acknowledge any other game companies existed other than TSR, and it was a sticking point for the Blooms that Chaosium wanted acknowledgement in the title page of the book. So Chaosium never wanted the material removed, but the Blooms did so just so they wouldn't have to mention Chaosium in the book again. Lou Zachi worked in dice manufacturing, wargaming, and in distribution for hobbyist games, including role-playing games. He says the entire fiasco was intentional. After Chaosium announced their new role-playing game, Call of Cthulhu, Gygax saw an excuse to squeeze money from others trying to horn in on the role-playing game industry. Gygax had James Ward include the Cthulhu Mythos material, and after the books came out quickly enough that it beat Call of Cthulhu to the market, he called up Chaosium and spoke with Greg Stafford. Gygax accused them of plagiarism because they released the first Cthulhu role-playing game material and demanded a licensing fee for Call of Cthulhu. Stafford was confused and asked when they got their license from Arkham House. Gygax said he'd call back because Gygax believed that the Lovecraft material was public domain, he didn't have a license, and therefore the entire plan backfired. Chaosium sued TSR instead, and TSR was forced to pay a settlement and could keep printing the Call of Cthulhu Mythos material only if they included a statement that the material was owned by Chaosium. Gygax refused to allow free advertising for a competitor in his book, so even though it was too late to do more than add a credit to the second printing, he pulled the Cthulhu material from the third and subsequent printings. Okay, so we've heard from several different sides. What really happened? Ah, uh -uh. seriously, we have no idea. Chaosium still exists and is still making the Call of Cthulhu game, so they have zero reason to come forward after all this time with any new records, correspondence, or legal documents from that time. And if there was a legal settlement involved, most of those incorporate some form of legal gag order that prevents anyone involved from talking about the terms of the settlement. And the consequences of revealing that information may have survived TSR's sale to Wizards of the Coast and Wizards' sale to Hasbro, as the new parent company inherits the legal agreement. Uh, just a warning, this may come up again in future videos. Any records TSR may have had are long gone, either due to various personnel changes over the years at TSR, moving the corporate offices a couple of times, or the aforementioned sale of the company to Wizards of the Coast. The only thing we have to go on are the stories from people who were there at the time. James M. Ward worked at TSR and wrote Deities and Demigods, so he's likely to be a little bit more defensive of his and TSR's part in the matter. Steve Perrin worked for Chaosium and wrote material for Call of Cthulhu, so he's likely to be more defensive of his and Chaosium's part. Meanwhile, Louis Zochi had a severe falling out with TSR due to a business deal that went badly, and his company was replaced as the sole manufacturer of dice for TSR, so he's not very likely to cut TSR or Gygax personally much slack. And on top of any biases involved, all of this happened almost 40 years ago. That is a very long time to give someone's brain to play with the memories. There's even a psychological term for when we do this, rewriting our own memories so that we remember events in a way that paints us in a more favorable light. That term? The Rashomon Effect. So all we can really do is look at the information we have and try to find the truth that's probably somewhere in the middle. 
To start with, we assume that none of the three people are making a statement that they know to be false. However, they may be remembering things differently or have filled in the blanks over the years for events that they were not personally present for. To find the truth that lies in the middle, we need to look at what facts we have, where the similarities of the stories are, and what we know about the people involved and their motivations at that time. When the assignment for deities and demigods was given to James Ward, he was told to make a list of the various pantheons he wanted to include in the game. He did so and passed up the chain of command. Gary Gygax and the Blooms, making up the board of directors at TSR, looked over the list and realized there may be some potential rights issues with a few of them. However, it also might be a good way to beat one of their competitors to the punch if they could get the role-playing game statistics for the Cthulhu Mythos out to gamers first. D&D was the single most dominant game in the now-growing role-playing game genre, and if gamers already had the Cthulhu Mythos in their D&D games, why would they spend money on a competitor's product? They could save that money to spend on more D&D books. So they sent out letters to the right holders and got permission for the Elric material and Cthulhu Mythos. But there's a little complication that I've mentioned a little bit, but I haven't talked about, and it still exists to this day. No one is entirely sure how much of Lovecraft's work is still under copyright and how much is in public domain. The question was even murkier at the time because the Copyright Act of 1976 had just changed what determines the length of copyright from the date of publication to the death of the author, which left some of Lovecraft's work in the public domain and some of it still under copyright. In particular, short stories under copyright included The Call of Cthulhu and At the Mountain of Madness, two of Lovecraft's most popular stories and the first appearance of Cthulhu, Migo, and the Shoggoths, all of which were in Deities and Demigods. So when Chaosium found out that TSR had overstepped what they considered public domain and had used material from Michael Moorcock's Elric in the book, they sent a letter to TSR informing them of their license. This sparked a phone call between Gary Gygax and Greg Stafford, where they realized that they both had proper legal permission, but Chaosium's was a little bit more legal. TSR realized they would never win a lawsuit with a pair of letters compared with actual license deals and signed contracts, and Chaosium realized they couldn't pursue legal action without also suing Michael Moorcock and dragging Arkham House into a lawsuit over the public domain status of Lovecraft's work the former of which would have caused ill will with a business partner, and the latter would be a long, drawn-out mess that might not work out well for anyone involved. So the two sides worked out a compromise. TSR couldn't pull out several pages of the second printing this late in the process, but they could add an acknowledgement to Chaosium in the title page. This worked out well for Chaosium as it promoted their games, and the D&D stats for both Elric and the Cthulhu Mythos would drive up interest in complete games based on those licenses from them. Meanwhile, TSR wasn't too happy about advertising a competitor in their flagship product, so they decided to just pull the material rather than continue with the deal, doing it as soon as they could. Meanwhile, James Ward is upset because he did everything right. He gave them a list. They approved it. He got the legal clearances and writing for everything he used in his book, and his work was still getting butchered. He felt like the board didn't have his back by not pursuing the matter more aggressively. Is that what actually happened? I have no idea. Probably not. The film, Rashomon, ends with a fourth telling of events, this time from a woodman who was completely uninvolved who happened to see the events. So his version of events was the unvarnished truth. I'm not that woodsman. I don't have any special knowledge about what happened. Hell, all of this happened the year I was born. I heard the same stories I just told you, and I looked at what series of events fit the undisputed facts that could easily be misremembered when seen from a different point of view. My version is just as true as James's, or Steve's, or Lou's, by which I mean it's close, but it's probably not the whole story. And it's a story we may never know the real answer to. This is my day of the day, my day. It's the way that I'm